First thing I'd like to thank Natasha Ritzma and Georgia Schwender for putting this together and inviting me here. It's always an honor. My name's Don, I'm a physicist at Fermilab. I do particle physics research. I've been doing it, well, since I was the age of the students here. Um, I spent the last 35 or 40 years trying to uncover the laws of nature. I mean, that's what particle physicists do. And so what I want to talk about here is to give you a sense of what the most modern physics understanding of the, the building blocks of reality. So what that really means is we know, you know, we, we have a, an intuition of the world around us. We know that we can walk through air, we can't fall through the floor and, and all of that. So we, we have a, you know, a real clear gut feel for what the world is made of. However, over the course of the last hundred years or so, physicists have come to realize that much of this is an illusion, or more to the point, the deepest and most fundamental building blocks of the universe around us are very different than our intuition. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to basically tell you, I'm going to really surprise you, I think. So, but before we do that, I want to warn you. And the thing I want to warn you at is that the following talk could easily, easily, easily be misinterpreted as supporting an awful lot of mystical mumbo jumbo. Um, and so I don't want you to walk out thinking that I am supporting that. On the other hand, many of the things I will say really sound a lot like some of the things you might hear. So, first thing is, it doesn't. And the second is, you've been warned. So, now, if you want to take what I say as confirming some belief, that's your business, but you're doing it on your own. All right, so we are in a, uh, an art facility, so I would like to remind you, perhaps something of which is very clear, that the universe is, has, the universe, the world, it is fundamentally beautiful. I mean, there are things, and I'll show a series of pictures here, that are just breathtaking. And, and a lot of, of reality is just that. There are things like this beautiful rose, something very, very different, different scale, with the planet Saturn. And, you know, what's more breathtaking than a, a beautiful sunrise? or sunset. Each of these phenomena, whether it be the rose, the planet, or the light breaking through the clouds, occurs from a, a different, you know, they're very different. They're, they're not the same, and yet they all invoke a beauty. And, you know, same thing with living matter, the, this beautiful swan. But what I want to talk about here is a deeper beauty, a sort of intellectual beauty about how all of those things, everything I just showed you, are in fact very fundamentally similar at the very deepest levels in ways that, that perhaps are surprising. And so this here is what's called the, uh, uh, the Flammarion wood engraving. Some people call it a woodcut, and I'm told that by experts that it in fact is not a woodcut. And it's called the Flammarion engraving, not because Camille Flammarion made it, but because it appeared in the front piece of his 1880 book, uh, L'Atmosphere Meteorologie Populaire, which is my bad French accent for the atmosphere popular meteorology. Um, the author of this engraving, or the, the artist, is unknown. It's lost to history. Um, however, it's very evocative of precisely what this talk is about, where you have the world, the, the, the visible cosmos that we see around us, and you have this person peering through the veil, looking at the gears and the workings that make it all happen. So, I would like to start by reminding you that this is not a recent phenomena. So, uh, I really like this painting, um, and probably many of you know it. It's the uh, Scuola di Atene by uh, Raffaello Sanzio da Urbino, or for me, it's the School of Athens by the artist Raphael. Um, it exists in the Apostolic uh, Palace in the Vatican, um, and it was uh, 
painted between 1509 and 1511. But the reason I put this up here, partially because it's really pretty and I like it, but partially it is a reminder of the heritage of Western culture, which has long been interested in the questions that I'm going to talk about here. And so the various people are, are different philosophers. It's a you know, representation, but I want to draw your attention to one of them, this guy here, who is Aristotle. So Aristotle was one of the early people thinking about the nature of realities uh, portrayed next to his, his mentor, Plato. And Aristotle came up with perhaps, or wrote down the first sort of, not quite quantitative, but, but conceptual idea about the material of which the universe is created. And so he said, you know, when we look at you, me, animals, rocks, and so forth, we can dig down and what we find is that they are made of four distinct elements. And they are water, earth, air, and fire. And uh, there was a, uh, another element which is not mentioned as much, the fifth element, the void, in which all of these things combine. And the idea was that um, something that we, you know, actual fire, like what we think of as fire, was a mix of the elemental fire and air, because when you burn something, it gets hot, but it floats up. So it was a mix of elemental fire and elemental air, and that's what real fire is. Now, we don't believe this anymore, but I wanted to remind you that this is not something that physicists have just come up with in the last hundred years or so. What it is, it's an age-old question asked by people for literally thousands of years. And our, our understanding has evolved, but the drive to understand is the same. So nowadays, this is what we would call the elements of nature. So the, the material that, that we are made of is made up of different combinations of a little over 100 uh, chemical elements. Now, don't worry, there's not going to be a chemistry test or anything, but I want to remind you that we've gone from the four elements that are sort of metaphysical to these are, are actual things that we've measured and we know very well how they tie together. But I don't want to get into the chemistry so much. Is I want to remind you, this, you probably saw this in maybe third grade, the different levels of matter. So you have solid, and you have liquid, and you have gas. But the one I want to draw your attention to is the solid one over here, because it's a really nice sort of conceptual idea of what happens with matter. So each one of those little blue circles is supposed to be an atom or a molecule of some sort. And it sort of shows you that the reason you can't put your hand through something is because the atoms are all too close to one another, and there's just no space to go between them. And you kind of get a little bit of a sense of that, like if you were in a, one of these ball, game, you know, ball pits, like when you were a kid, you jump in and all the balls moved around. But that's more like liquid because the balls could move around. But in the case where they're all packed together, that is a, a common understanding by most people of what the nature of matter is like. But I want to give you a different sense of it. And so I'm going to start with something that you've probably taken in a class in high school, perhaps, and the idea that something like water is actually made of molecules. So you've heard water is H2O, and so that's all that's a picture of. Now, the, the thing to draw your attention, those letters are a little small, perhaps. Um, you have a, a dew drop might be a millimeter in size, but a water molecule is much, much smaller. It's about 10 to the minus seventh meter, so it's about a little bit more than a millionth of a meter, so it's really tiny. Or, if you, you know how big a millimeter is, and these molecules, if you have a millimeter, you can put about, say, of order 3,000 of them side by side within a millimeter. So they're very, very small. And so that's the first, perhaps, interesting thing, is that the world, the building blocks of reality, are much smaller than anything we can see. And so that's why it took us so long to understand this. But now I want to really kind of mess with your head because while water is H2O, H is hydrogen. It's the simplest atom of the simplest element. It consists of a single proton at the center 
with an electron swirling around the outside of it. And the size of an atom is about a tenth of a micrometer, so 10 to the minus 7 meters. It's very small. And this probably is the mental image that you have in your head of what an atom looks like. This is something that's very common, where the, the sizes here are terribly disproportionate. They're wrong. But the idea is that you have a nucleus at the center, and you have electrons swirling around the outside. And while that is something that we often see, it, it is a little bit misleading. And so I want to just give you some sense of scales. So what are the sizes of these things? Well, an atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters, so very small. But the nucleus of the atom is 10 to the minus 14 meters. So the nucleus, or the atom I should say, if you look on its radius, it's 10,000 times bigger than the nucleus. But that's the radius. If you look at the volume, you have to do a little bit of math. Don't worry, that's the only math and we're not really going to do it. But if you, you want to figure out the, the volume of something, you need to know its radius in qubit. And if you do that, what you find is that the volume of an atom is about 10 to the 12th times bigger than the nucleus of an atom. And that is a trillion to one. So an atom is very, very big compared to the nucleus. Of course, we've been studying the nucleus of atoms since like 1930, so almost 100 years. Um, I want to give you a sense of scale. So this picture is not quite perfect. You'll bear with me. But suppose you had a, a single proton and you blew it up to the size of a millimeter. Now, these BBs are actually three millimeters, and that's just because I couldn't find a picture of a handful of millimeter-sized BBs. But it kind of gets the idea. So let's just suppose one of those, those BBs is a proton. If that was true, what would the size of an atom be? Well, the size of an atom, well, we have this lovely picture of downtown Chicago, and what an atom would be is it would fill up Soldier Field. So to give you a real, I, I like this because it's very intuitive. If you were to talk about a hydrogen atom, you would have a BB on the 50-yard line of Soldier Field, and the rest of the atom would be an electron, which is like the size of a dust particle, flying around in a big sphere the size of Soldier Field. And so that leads you to a very, very simple conclusion. And the simple conclusion is, you're mostly empty space. So that is a very bizarre concept. Why is it that you can't put your hand through something? I mean, that, that picture from third grade said that all of the atoms are packed close together. And that is, well, the atoms are packed close together. But if the atoms are empty, why is it that you can't put your hand through, say, this? And the reason is a combination of things. Partly it's because there are electric fields holding the, the electron inside the proton, or not sorry, inside the atom. And it's basically those fields fighting with one another. And the fields can't pass through each other, even though they are not substantial. And then there's another more complicated thing, because I know there's a chemistry professor here, having to do with the nature of how electrons talk to each other. Basically, um, electrons are, are like cats. They sort of don't like to be together in the same place at the same time, and they push each other apart. But that's a sec separate thing. The real takeaway message is that atoms and you and me and the floor, the earth, everything are basically empty space. Now I want to then, because while atoms are interesting and the nuclei is interesting, the study of atoms is sort of like, sort of, I don't know, 1880s or something. And the study of nuclei is like 100 years ago. I'm actually interested in what is the smallest thing that we've ever understood and to know what the building blocks that, that make things up. So I'm going to kind of guide you through this. So we have a, 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 a dew drop of water, which is made of molecules, H2O. Um, the molecules are made of atoms. Atoms, for instance, hydrogen especially, is made of a proton and electron. The proton has inside it things called quarks. I'll talk more about those because those are often something that you haven't heard of yet. 
And, but this here, this thing called a quark with this ridiculous U, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute, this is the smallest building block that anybody has ever discovered in all of our experiments. And the size of a proton, for instance, a proton is 10 to the minus 15 meters. So roughly speaking, a proton is as small to a, say like a virus, which you might have seen in one of your classes, as a virus is compared to us. So protons are terribly, terribly small. Protons contain within them these particles called quarks, and we don't know how big quarks are, but what we do know is that they are at least one ten thousandth, they're, they're at least 10,000 times smaller than a proton or more. And the reason I say or more is because every time we've tried to look at the size of a quark, we've never actually seen its size. But we do know what our best microscope can see, and it can see things that are one ten thousandth the size of a proton, it does, we don't see the size, so it just means that that thing's smaller. We can see that it's there, we see how it interacts, but we, it's just tiny. So, let me try to drag the, the whole quark into what we know about, about matter. So there's our periodic table, our friend again, and there's something that you know, that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. You've got the nucleus in the middle, and you've got the electrons swirling around the outside. The proton and neutron are made of these things called quarks. So this, while that is the chemical periodic table, this is the modern periodic table. These are the smallest objects of which we're familiar. So inside a proton and neutron, we have a U and a D thing, and they are these things called quarks. So quarks are found inside the nucleus of atoms, and they have absolutely ridiculous names. They are the UD, um, S or CS, TB are up, down, charm strange, top and bottom, and that is because physicists are smart asses and we come up with really ridiculous names. Um, but if you take an up and down quark, two of, well, take those, you take two ups and a down, that makes a proton. If you take two downs and an up, you make a neutron, and you have an electron. So over here, if you take the up and down quark and an electron, that's all you need to make matter. The neutrino is another thing, uh, could talk about that a long time, I don't want to get into that. Now these other quarks, the uh, CS, charm, strange, top and bottom, those are heavier quarks, they are very, uh, well they're unstable, they decay in fractions of a second. So the rest of those things only were common in the universe basically shortly after the Big Bang. But the up and down quark can be found in protons and neutrons, and so that's, if we want to talk about the building blocks of nature, that's what they are. Now, what I want to get you to talk about now is, I've told you that matter is mostly empty space, but now I want to tell you, where does mass come from? So, you know, all of us, we step on the scale, sometimes it's a number we don't like, but where in this chain of, of matter does mass, you know, the, the, our weight, where does our mass and weight come from? And so I'm going to start just by going down from, you know, a, a person through the small, through each scale and find out what's going on. So if you just take an average guy, say he's 200 pounds or something like that, you could ask yourself, if you took, up, took them apart and just put the molecules in place, how much do the molecules of that guy weigh? And the answer is 200 pounds. All right, so that's good. That's kind of what you'd expect. Now let's look at atoms. Suppose you took the molecules apart and then you put the atoms all in little piles and added up how much they weighed. You also get 200 pounds. All right, let's talk then, if atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons, let's pull those apart. Take all the protons in a pile, all the neutrons in a pile, all the electrons in a pile. And what do you get there? Well, what you get there is kind of interesting. The protons and neutrons weigh about 200 pounds. The electrons weigh about a couple of ounces. So that's the first message, is electrons are not where your mass is. Your mass is in the protons and neutrons in your, the center of your atoms. So now, let's ask, since protons and neutrons are made of, uh, yeah, made of quarks, we don't have to worry about the electron because that's kind of negligible. 
So we have protons and neutrons. Quarks are found inside protons and neutrons. And if this weighs 200 pounds, it stands to reason that the mass of the quarks that make you up is also 200 pounds. But if you do this, you find out that it's four pounds. So now this is a very bizarre thing. I have a proton. Proton has three quarks in it. The three quarks add up to four pounds, or if you add up everybody's, you add up the quarks, it's four pounds. But the protons weigh 200 pounds. So either there's something more inside the proton or there's something I haven't told you. And that is really cool. So you've got to ask, where's the mass? So we had this picture I had of the proton with these quarks inside zooming around. Now the proton is 10 to the minus 15th meters. It is uh, a quadrillionth of a meter. So it's invisibly small. The quarks are inside them and they are orbiting around, moving at nearly the speed of light. The speed of light is 186,000 miles per second fast enough to go around the Earth seven times in a single second, or 300,000 meters per second, or rather 300,000 kilometers per second, if you like metric. So these guys are really zooming in this tiny area. And if they're really zooming, this guy comes into play, because you've heard about Einstein, and Einstein came up with this equation that says E equals mc squared. And if these things are moving very, very fast, then they have a huge amount of energy and energy equals mass, and so therefore, if you have a lot of energy, you have a lot of mass, and so the, the mass that makes up us isn't stuff, it's, you know? When we think of mass, something that's heavy is just more stuff, it's lead or it's a rock, it's, it's more. But when you dig down inside a proton, remember, the quarks don't weigh anything themselves, but they have a lot of energy. Now they're moving, so there's a lot of motion energy, but remember, they're moving at nearly the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second, inside the tiniest volume you can ever imagine, and that means there has to be incredibly strong forces holding them together, or they'd fly off somewhere, right? Something goes fast, it goes flying. And so that means that there is a lot of, of potential energy. So you've heard of motion in your physics class, motion or kinetic energy, potential energy, there is a tremendous amount of energy, but not much mass inside a proton. And so when you put that all together, your mass, the mass that makes up you, the mass that makes up everything, is 98% energy. It's not stuff, it's energy. And so, which is why I started out with the beginning of this uh, presentation saying, it gets really easy for people to start thinking all these cosmic things, like, wow, man, we're all energy. We're all part of the cosmic, yeah, well, yes. But it doesn't mean that. But it is true that we are made mostly of energy, which is not something that you would expect. All right, so I have one more little topic I want to talk about, and then I'm open to questions about anything, this, the, uh, the show next door, or anything else. So I'm going to remind you that while we've done this thing that you are mostly empty space and you're mostly energy, I got problems. It gets weirder. Empty space isn't truly empty. So if you took, you know, I don't know, a, a, a fish tank right here and sucked all the air out and shielded it from everything, it's not really empty. And I'm going to tell you what's going on there. So space is filled with a thing called a field. Now, a field is a concept that's tricky, so you are asking, what's a field? Well, actually, that's a field. So that was a dumb question. You all know what a field. Anyway, no, sorry. That's not what I mean by a field. I meant something else. Um, suppose, the way to get an idea of what a field is, um, I, I chose these mason jars. So suppose you had a mason jar, and you sucked all the air out of it, and you somehow shielded it from light. You put it in the dark. Well, even though there's nothing in there, you know that there's still gravity inside the jar. I mean, you can't feel it. There's nothing in there being pulled to the bottom of the jar, but we know that there's a gravity field in the jar. So that's kind of what I mean by fields in general. So if you look in empty space, there's not just gravity fields. There's a lot of different types of fields, and that is the nature of where we're going to. Now, each field, there is a field for each one of these particles. So I introduced the quarks, leptons. The most familiar lepton is the electron. 
Um, the ones I've circled here, that's what makes up the matter of you and me. But there are, there's up quark fields, down quark fields, charm fields, strange fields, and so forth, all these fields. And those fields are everywhere in space. So that's the first thing that you might be hard to believe or get your head around, but that's what modern physics claims. So I want to you know, take another thing and talk about vibrations. So this is a guitar, and each string vibrates differently. <clears throat> and that is kind of what we think of that these particles are. So if there is, the, the, you know, the field here is one dimensional. I mean, it's a string, but imagine it's three dimensional. So you've got something that can vibrate in many ways. Like if you hit a bell, the bell vibrates in all different ways. So um, the idea is that this might be the equivalent of say an up quark field, a representation of it and a down quark and so forth. And each one of them vibrates. And it turns out the vibrations of the field are what we call particles. So here's maybe an easier way to think about it. So another thing that we might think of as a field is air. And air can vibrate, that's how sound works. So if you make a, have a speaker, you get this vibration. And what the problem, this is not a great analogy because we know in air it's made of molecules and the vibrations are the air molecules moving closer together and farther apart. So don't take that too seriously, but it's hard to do this analogy. But if you think of air as a field where the vibrations can be denser and less dense, that's how sound works. And so the same thing works with fields and particles. And so this is sort of a kind of a representation. So that bottom thing is a field, it's vibrating. And the top thing is just showing, that's like an electron moving across. So the idea is that this, uh, this gizmo, and we'll do that one more time because I think it's cool. All right. So if you think of the red thing as a field and it's vibrating, then you kind of ignore that you can't see the field, but you see this object moving through space, that's an electron. So that is what we think at the very deepest level matter is made of. It's made of vibrations. So that's true. Everything that exists is a vibrating field. And that is kind of bizarre. So now we have some very bizarre truths of modern science. And the bizarre truths are, one, matter is mostly made of empty space. We're not solid like we think we are. Inside the atoms there are quantum fields. Mass is mostly made of energy fields, so we're empty space, we're made of energy fields, and then at the very end, the remainder is vibrations of field. So these are all true. If you ask uh, any reasonable physicist, they will tell you, yeah, we believe that. And so it would not take very much for someone like one of these gals to say, aha, so you see, you got crystals, you got pyramid power, you got all this stuff. And I have had that happen where I've given this talk and someone has come and say, so like you're telling me we're all like real energy beings and, and like we're part of the cosmic vibrations and like I'm giving you good vibes and well, yes, but no. <laughs> so I don't want to, you know, make fun of these guys, gals, but all right. So now some of you may find some of these, um, these claims to be compelling, and I do not wish to, you know, make fun of anyone, but, or even argue with them, but, you know, you have astral projection as an idea, Reiki massage, where the idea is that one person's energy runs over another person's and heals them. You have uh, Taoism with the whole yin-yang thing that nothing is there really, everything is impermanent. You got chakras and the energy sources inside people's bodies and crystals. So these are all things that are found inside mysticism and alternative ways of thinking, but they use the same words that I just used. And so it is very, very easy to, to be confused and to say, well, scientists have proved all these things are true. Now, 
I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue about these things, but what I am going to tell you is that the things I told you, the words I told you, don't mean that. If that's true, perhaps, I don't know, but that's not what I told you. And just to drive that point home, I made a picture of Einstein laughing, thinking about all that. So, um, so you're welcome to believe whatever you want, I don't care, but I don't want you to walk away saying that Don Lincoln told you that all that stuff is proved by science, because it's not. So that brings us back to the part where we started and remind you that, that what we're doing here, now, what I told you is merely our current understanding of the laws of nature. If you had asked me about this 50 years ago, I would have told you a different story. If you ask me in 50 years from now, I might tell a different story still, because science is continuously evolving. We take what we know, we try to understand something, we discover something, we adjust how we think of things, and it goes on and on. And I would expect in 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, we would have even more complex, interesting ideas about the laws of nature. But, but that's what this is all about. It's, it's looking at the universe and trying to understand the workings behind us. So, at this point, we are at, can't help, we're at a fork in the road. Um, and this fork in the road is the following. We have a choice, and I'll let you guys decide. If I've bored you, we can finish. That's our regular scheduling program. But I also spoke with Natasha briefly, and I would, she asked if I might speak about a few of the artistic pieces in the museum. And so we picked out just a couple. So which would you guys prefer? Would you rather get up now, because I hear there's cheese out there, or like to hear a little bit about some of the few pieces in there? So what do we got? We got, do we have wine? Or I guess cheese, I don't know if we have wine. Cheese, wine be better. Or should we do some more art? Well, there's stuff out there is mass, so it's not moving anywhere. It's not for us. Ah, it will wait for us. Okay. Ah. So we're going with that. All right. So this won't take this will not take too too long, but I did want to talk about a couple. So this is one particular piece that's in the museum. It's called Binary Bypass Neutrinos for Data to Communication by Ellen Sandor. So there's two sides to it. We have the back side over here and the front side. You see uh, these lines going into the earth, things coming out. You have this digital business going around. If you look very, very carefully, you see the outline of a person there, which is probably some metaphor of God, but actually it's just me taking a picture because it's a reflection. <laughs> but, you know, I figured I'd be grand, why not? So ignore the, the shadow of the person there. And so what this, I mean, I... I I understand there was a, a presentation by Ellen, and she could tell you far more what was in her head, but I can tell you about the physics behind this. So my understanding, since it's neutrinos, is she uh, learned about the neutrino physics at Fermilab. And so neutrinos are a, a familiar particle. They're not one that you're, well, I say familiar. They're common. They're not something that's familiar to most people. But neutrinos are created in nuclear reactions. They were discovered back in, uh, um, let's see, they were discovered in the 50s, but they were imagined in the 30s. And neutrinos interact so little that they can pass through a lot of matter without interacting. And in fact, so if you, want it, if you need a lot of neutrinos, you get a nuclear reactor. The biggest nuclear reactor around is the sun. And so the sun is spewing out neutrinos all the time. And so they are coming and they are hitting the earth just like, the, uh, just like sunlight is. And so if you are scared of things, you might want to shield yourself from them. But there's a problem. If you wanted to shield yourself from the neutrinos from the sun, you'd have to put a lot of matter between you and them. And I'm not talking, you know, like going underground. Because to stop the neutrinos from the sun, it would take five light years of solid lead to stop half of them. And in that sense, it goes right through the earth. It goes through you. In fact, every day, every minute of every day, something like 10 to the 14 neutrinos are going through you and through your entire life, maybe one will interact. So I wouldn't worry too much about it. But this is what this is to symbolize, I think, is the neutrinos that go through the earth and come out the other side. And I believe the, uh, the digital business is sort of representing all of the data that we take on it. So that, I believe, is what the, the meaning of that 
peace is. Now, there's another piece by Jim Jenkins called Does This Ring a Bell? And if you haven't done this, you should go in there, and it's really cool. So it's got all this, you know, metal pieces welded together. There is this copper pipe right here with a hole down the center. And there's a very strong magnet, sort of the size of a sugar cube. If you drop that magnet inside the, well, if you drop the magnet like here, it falls like you'd expect. It hits the ground in a second or something like that. If you drop the magnet inside the pipe, it falls very, very slowly. And I am told that it takes, what, 13 seconds? 12 seconds. 12 seconds, 12 seconds to fall. So it's as if when this magnet is falling through the pipe, that somehow gravity is less. And so, now I don't want to tell people, you know, deep secrets, but, you know, back in the 40s, there were people who, you know, this is a 1940 uh, patent thing, where someone were trying to take magnets and saying if they float around and that it would cause anti-gravity. And you can still get people that talk about this and they claim that, you know, that's how UFOs work. The anti-gravity thing is causing this to float. And that's all garbage, but I put it up there because I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> what really is, is there is a thing called eddy currents. And so if you drop a magnet through a pipe or any kind of, um, Thing that, that conducts electricity, if you move a magnet near a conductor, it makes electric uh, fields and it makes electric currents. So as this falls, the magnet is moving, it makes a current in the pipe, but electric currents make magnetic fields. So this is kind of cool, they call them eddy currents. The magnet, the magnet makes current, the current makes magnet, the magnetic field from the current um, opposes the magnet in the, that's being dropped, and the net effect is that you have a magnetic field putting up that slows the fall. So you can do it in there. It's really cool. You, should, you gotta do it. If you're here, got a few minutes, you should go look at it. It's pretty cool. All right, and so the final piece that I was asked to talk about is this Fields by uh, Ricardo Mondragon. And this one I picked to do partly because I believe that this is meant to evoke the, the, the phenomena that I was talking about, that everything is fields and that the vibrations in the field are particles. And so I think, again, not have, wanting to speak for the artist, but I think all of this motion here is meant to evoke that the, the existence of matter, which is simply the vibration of fields. So that's what this is attempting to do artistically. There's some artistic license here, clearly, but the the intent is there, and um, I'm actually fairly fond of uh, um, collaborations between artists and, and scientists because science speaks a, often an intimidating language. And art is a way, if you have a really good collaboration between an artist and a scientist, the two of them can find ways to, to, um, to benefit from each of their specialties. One person understanding the world, the other person understanding how to represent ideas in accessible ways. And the two of them together can maybe make it so that science isn't quite so scary. And so that's why I'm very happy to see this, uh, this exhibition and I would like to invite you all to go take a look. And with that, we're done. <laughs>